Sweet. So another big welcome from me, guys. Uh, my name is Regan Standing. I'm a uh, senior academic staff member at the Centre for Sports Science and Human Performance, same as Russ. Um, and we have been lucky enough to be part of this Polo Science brand over the last year. It has only been about a year or a season. Um, we've had the pleasure of working with some really enthusiastic and motivated players and people within the sport this, um, in the last season, which has allowed us to grow and, and kind of uh, become more exposed to, to what polo is, really. Um, did anyone here actually see us floating around last season? Oh, yeah, yeah. Those two awkward guys trying not to get hit by horses and bulls. <laughs> yeah, that's us, turn up, sort of waving the people across. Um, yeah, that was us. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about next is... Um, is some of the research that we've done in the past year, uh, trying to squeeze five studies a year's worth of work into about 10 minutes. So I'm trying to simplify it, we'll break it down. If you've got questions, um, we'll have time later this evening to talk about it. So we'll maybe save it for then or, or for some of the later presentations. Um, because the goal tonight is to stick to time. And uh, I know people in the horse industry struggle with that sometimes. So we'll do our, we'll do our best. So, these things, the screenshots up on the board here are, are the published papers that we've had in the past year. Okay, there are five of them. Um, if you want to take photos of this and go and have a look later, please do. Um, I'm just going to give you a basic summary of each as we go through. Um, <clears throat> this first paper, uh, paper here, uh, unfortunately we weren't working with them face to face, but we were working with um, the, the King Power Foxes, uh, who won the 2017 Gold Cup for the third consecutive year. Um, we were looking at their footage online and, and basically these guys amazed us and we were thinking, man, these guys are awesome. Let's try and get involved with what's going on. So they have two of the best players in the world at the time, Gonzalito and Facundo Pires. Uh, amazing, let's be honest. What they do on the pitch is, is pretty ridiculous. So we asked the question basically, what makes this winning team? These guys have been so dominant for quite a while. What are they doing different or what are they doing in the sport? And obviously there's a lot of things that we have to consider. Uh, entering into this, especially as Russ and I don't have the biggest polo background, and by some I mean like none, really. <laughs> so we, we went into this with, with eyes wide open and, ho and built some good relationships along the way, which really helped. Um, but things like your horsemanship, horse management, tactics, teamwork, um, players, that's an important part. Um, but what we looked at in this paper was the specific types of shots and the success that they had during those shots and other maneuvers during the games. Um, <clears throat> So basically we were asking the question, what was the best team doing and then what were the better players in that team doing differently? So we designed what we call a performance matrix. Basically we jotted down a few things around what we could look for that they were doing in the game. Things like the types of shots they were playing, both forehand and backhand, uh, of various lengths, the write-offs, um, the penalty counts, the turnovers, a whole range of different things. And we sat down and watched those games over their tournament and started jotting these down on the matrix to see what trends and what statistics we could find to support why they were so good. Um, so results of this study basically suggested, uh, and very surprising, um, that uh, the more penalties that you give away, the less likely you are to win. I bet we didn't know that. <laughs> um, obviously penalties provide quite a, a strong goal scoring opportunity and especially at that high goal level are often converted as well so it makes sense the same goes for turnovers if you turn the ball over more you are more likely to lose the game again very groundbreaking stuff but for us what this showed is that we can pull out these trends and statistics from the game which is cool interesting though at the player level we did start uh, did start to see some interesting things so in this team they had two 10 goalers and two one goalers and what we found, and as you can kind of see on these, this one, no, this one, we've got fat fingers, these sheets here, the two 10 goalers simply had a higher success rate in their shots. Basically the shots that they were taking and the things that they were doing were more successful. They were either maintaining possession with their shots or the ball was going to their other players rather than turnovers. All right? But what we also found is they had less variability between games, so they were more consistent. And again, that makes sense. As, the, as your handicap goes up, you're more successful and you're more consistent, which is great. The same trend was seen for the two one goalers. Now these two here are our one goalers, the, one, the two on the left. And we could see that through our statistics, one of those one goalers was actually a lot more successful and a lot less variable than the other. And surprisingly, he then went up in the handicap the next season. 
So our matrix here had some, and I'll be very careful the way I word this, some small sort of predictive capabilities for that, that handicapping system. We know obviously very subjective and there's a lot to it, but we started to see some trends in there which was cool. So that was our first paper and that got us really interested in what was going on. Basically for us it was a, a chance to get some insight into the, the sport and just have a little bit of a look. While we were doing that, we started hanging out at the polo grounds and started interacting with some of the players in the room actually and, and many of the associates that are floating around. This next study for us was more academically driven um, but it was a stepping stone for us to do some pretty cool things later in the season. Did it, was anyone, um, well I know there was a few that wore them, did any of you guys see these weird little pouches floating around on the players through some of the tournaments last season? Oh, that was us, that was us. Um, so what we tried to do was see if the global positioning systems or GPS were basically a viable option during polo. It's, it's very fast paced, it's dynamic, and because of the really, uh, what are we gonna call it? Unique movements that occur on the saddle, we weren't sure if the units were actually gonna be able to pick up reliable data. So the first study that we had to do with these was to basically test um, GPS units on the same person and see if the results came out similar to one another. All right, so we had two different types of units placed on our players. Um, we had 37 different rider horse interactions that we measured over the course of um, well, a few months of, of chuckers, and thank you to those who were part of that. Uh, we had a chest strap here um, that kind of goes like a, a bit of a bra. Um, you often see the All Blacks or, or the, the other sp sporting guys wearing that. Um, and we tried it against a pouch here that links onto the belt. Uh, so what we found is that both the, all of those data came out relatively reliable, okay? The same as what you'd see in any other sport, which was great news for us because that meant that where we positioned that GPS was down to the players. Um, and as we found out, players have their way of doing things and we don't like to change that, all right? And that same goes with most sports. Um, it did take some people a bit of convincing to wear these and give it a go. Um, but with the help of a few brave pioneers meant that we were able to get into it and, and get what we needed. So some of the feedback from the players, the chest straps were too weird and like bras. Fair. So some players didn't like that because of that. We also found that some of those straps on some of the uh, more muscular individuals uh, restricted some of the shoulder movement as well. So we're, we're a bit against using that and we found that that belt pouch was probably more realistic and, and better to use in the game. So we went with that. The only downside is that you had to be wearing a belt. And there's a few people who didn't like wearing belts and Russ and I often found ourselves prior to the game, belt off, there you go, and we're running around like this the rest of the game. <laughs> so we learned a lot of things. So as I said, this paper acted as a springboard for us and it was a really exciting time because what it allowed us to do is put together one of, well, as far as we're aware, the biggest polo research paper in the world to date. This study collected 338 chuckers of data from the New Zealand polo season last, last year. It's a lot of data. And when you see it on paper and in that Excel sheet, it's quite uh, intimidating. <laughs> what we tried to do with this paper is to compare the different levels of polo across different tournaments. So we had our zero goal, six, 10, 16, and 24 goal tournaments. And what we wanted to do was look at how similar or how different those, um, those games were in terms of things like the speeds achieved, the distances covered, um, accelerations, decelerations, um, impacts, and all of those sorts of things to see if this data would give us insight into how you train your horse. Right, everyone's got their own way of doing it, but if we could suggest that maybe these things were different through the different levels of polo, there might be some sort of indication there that we, we should be training them different. Can a horse that plays zero to six goal polo one weekend go and play 16 to 24 the next weekend? Right, it's not uncommon to see some of you guys out there changing it up across the weekends. And we just wanted to know if that was, I guess, a viable option with the horses you got. Before I carry on, before I tell you the results of this, what do you think about that? Talk to the person next to you. Are they different? Where? How? What do you reckon? Talk to the person next to you before I, I give you what we found. If they're different, how? I 
All right, so to let you know what we found, we found that as the level of the tournament was raised, the average speed achieved per chucker, the distance covered per chucker, the time spent between that sort of 40 and 60 kilometers an hour, um, accelerations, decelerations, sprints, all of those increased as we progressed through in a general sense. Okay, there were some exceptions to that, but generally that's what we saw. So as you can see here, we've got our, our distance per chucker here for our increasing levels of tournament, and down here is our average speed. We were seeing somewhere between 900 and 1200 meters more distance per chucker from a 6 to a 16 goal tournament, which is a lot. Every seven minutes you're covering an extra K than what you would be at that lower level tournament. Working at higher speeds, more turns, more accelerations, more decelerations, bigger toll on the horse. What we found was that zero and six goal polo was actually quite similar. It was actually quite similar in terms of most of those metrics. But there was a very big difference between those and the 16 and 24, and the 10 goal sat somewhere in the middle. So when we come to thinking about what that actually means, I guess it comes down to, are your horses ready for what you're about to do to them? All right. If you're, if you're changing between the lower goal and the higher goal polo quite frequently, are your horses actually ready for that, or are we putting them at risk? No, I don't know. I'm not the horse trainer, but these are the questions you need to be asking. Um, so that was exciting. That was cool. A lot of data, a lot of people um, partook in that study, and, um, and it seems to be that we've, we've got some nice results. I'm happy to discuss those further with you guys later. Similar to that, all things being equal. There's a big push globally at the moment around women's polo, uh, focusing on it. So we decided to, to take a look at that as well and look at how women's polo was comparing to the open polo around some of these GPS metrics. Um, the, the reason to do this was we wanted to be able to inform players and inform teams about where things were different and how we might be able to change those things to, to improve. Um, I don't want to speak about this too much at the moment because we're going to spend some time on it later with Nina. Um, but again, we collected this GPS data across two uh, 16 goal tournaments, a 16 goal open tournament and a 16 goal female tournament. Um, and basically what we found is that there is a greater spread in women's polo when it comes to most of those things like distance covered, speed, accelerations, decelerations. Typically we see um, a lot of the higher level females are doing exactly the same as what's happening in open polo. But what we do see is a greater spread throughout. Okay, so with women's polo still relatively new, we are looking to repeat this over the next few seasons to see how women's polo is growing as a whole and are we raising that lower level. That's all we're looking at here, just to see how we can improve, where the differences are, and what we can do about it. And the last one is all about the players. It's all about the players. Often something that's overlooked, I think, in polo from our very short time in it. A lot of focus on the horses, a lot of focusing on training. But you guys are riding the horses. What's going on? So we've been told anecdotally, 80-20 split. 80% horse, 20% player. 20% is still quite a lot. Um, based on this, we wanted to see what kind of athlete polo players are and how one player might be better than another, okay? So we put up a testing station at the Walker Memorial Tournament hosted by uh, Bombay Hills at Cambridge, uh, which was a great tournament. So you might have seen our tent there, we had a whole lot of stuff going on, tests and banners and, and a whole lot of cool stuff. Um, we ran 12 females and, uh, sorry, 12 males and seven females through all of our tests. We partially tested about 40, but what we found really early was that polo, polo, uh, polo players are quite broken. There's a lot of people who couldn't perform all of the tests and therefore we couldn't use their data. Funny that. Um, 
So these included tests such as uh, measures of leg strength, grip strength on both left and right hands, uh, and reaction times. And we plotted those against handicap to see what the better players were good at and where the differences lie. What we found was quite interesting. So we found moderate to large correlations to handicap with right hand grip strength and leg strength. Those two only. So basically those who had a higher handicap had a stronger stick hand. And obviously that lends itself to greater stick and ball control, which is a good thing. Um, we also found that the, the stronger leg muscles obviously allowed them to have a more sturdy base and uh, a better base to play the shots off. So those two things made a bit of sense to us. The left hand grip strength and reaction times had very poor correlations and that was something that surprised us initially. But then we had some conversations with a few of the players and it started to make a bit more sense. Obviously the left hand being the rain hand on polo, it requires a bit more of uh, uh, intricate movements or finesse I guess we could call it, rather than brute strength in a lot of cases. And reaction time we found really didn't mean a lot, which initially was surprising, eh? Um, but actually JP, you are the one who kind of helped us out with this. Watching your game, we actually found, and a good way to explain this is that some of those higher handicap players are a lot more proactive on the field. They're thinking two, three, four steps ahead, rather than actually reacting to what's happening on the pitch. Made sense, once we say it. <laughs> Took us a while to get there. So, um, this was a relatively simple study, um, but the person riding the horse is, is a critical, critical part of that player-pony relationship. And I think we need to start spending some more time there and, and having more talks around that. Um, so the strength, your fitness, the physical attributes is something we're going to start looking at over the next season as well, looking at how we can improve the players alongside the horses. Alright, that's me. That's me done. That's our last year worth of work. All summarised into about 10 minutes. I hope I was sticking to time there. <coughs> Real time and not horse time. <laughs> cool. Um, so we're going to have a chance to talk more about these later and ask a few questions. But I'd like you just to, to digest that for about a minute. And I want you to talk to the person next to you and think about something that you found interesting there or a question you might want to ask later or something that you will take away from that that we've done so far. So I'll just give you about 30 seconds to a minute to have that conversation now. <laughs> Paul, do you want to go get set up? And I'll walk them down. Yeah. Alright, so I'll give them to follow you. That's mine. So I give them to follow you.